My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Well, during the Easter octave, we naturally rejoice that Jesus is conquering over death, but it's also an opportunity to meditate more deeply what it really means for us today to consider the risen Christ, that he rose from the dead, because next year we'll do this as well. We're going to celebrate Easter, and we're going to go through pretty much the same rituals, right? And uh, every year, a new layer must be added to our understanding so that we can actually live that faith and that truth in the resurrection. And, of course, one of the elements that we see in the resurrection narrative is the fact that that Jesus actually appeared to people. He appeared. like We know that he appeared to Chephas, eh, Peter, then he appeared to the Twelve, and then at one point to more than 500 brethren at one time one time, and then to James, and then, uh, and then even the last but not least to Paul, right? on his road on his way to the road to Damascus, right? in a very unique way. And I mean, first to Peter, then to others, and then to Paul. Right? And to Paul, well, he reemphasized his mission right? to support the others. So he, Jesus is appearing to people. He's not appearing all bloodied and bedraggled looking. He's looking. Clean. You know, he's got his best suit on, so to speak. You know, he, he gives us his wonderful fragrance. He has a special, unique look to him. He is real. Like he's not a ghost. He's real. But yet, he is just vibrantly attractive like no man could ever be. He's the risen Christ. He's alive. He's luminous. And probably he's looking a lot like what he must have looked like during the transfiguration. You know, because there's this kind of divine aura about him. And so now today, we get one of the most famous appearances of Jesus, and that's when he made his appearance as he suddenly walked next to the disciples of Emmaus. They were on their way to Emmaus, right, from Jerusalem. But they didn't recognize him. (laughs) They were looking down. Maybe they were hoping for someone to give them a lift or something, you know, that somebody could pass by to make it easier. But there were no cars passing by. They were hitchhiking, but nobody was stopping for them, And there he is, walking next to him, but they don't recognize. So their eyes were swollen from the tears. And also because they probably kept their heads pretty low. Probably they're thinking, ah, who is this guy? Some other pilgrim, what is he, a tourist? Uh, You know, their minds are obscured. They they just can't see him. They're talking, their heads on to the ground. They're mourning, they're discouraged, they're grumpy. Maybe like those kids you see on the subway looking at their phones and they don't notice that some celebrity like Keanu Reeves has just walked in and sat next to them. Eh? Uh, maybe that's what they were like. I don't know. But, I mean, it happened to, say, to Mary Magdalene too. You know, she, she was one of the first ones to see him, but she didn't recognize him either. You know? And uh, she was very discouraged as well. But there he was, listening to their whining, to their sense of despair. At one point, they said to him, We had hoped that he would free us all, that he would come in and liberate us from the Romans. But no, he was killed by them. That's a, that's a pretty harsh expression. We had hoped. Meaning, yeah, at one point we were hopeful, but now we're not hopeful at all. <laughs> we're gone. I mean, this is, you know, the hope was all something that was in the past and it is now completely like lost forever. Their hope was gone. And then even the vague news about some women who had found the tomb empty, even that didn't boost them, didn't give them an inkling of hope. They just took it as, well, that's just fake news. It's just idle chatter. chatter. You can't believe everything you read in the Internet. you know. <laughs> so everything they said actually was correct, but they saw it all through a dark human lens a vision of failure, a hopeless crash and burn. And, you know, when we find ourselves tending to this kind of pessimism or a kind of a cynical attitude, suddenly, yeah, we lose our strength. Uh, We darken our life. And that 
And that attitude makes our steps unsure and even quite meaningless. And we, and we have no ability even to console or to encourage anyone. It's like we lose all the sense of empathy for the very pain of others. And I, I would guess we get pretty annoying when that happens. I suspect these two disciples were pretty, pretty annoying. You know? And the Lord had to endure their, their whining. So after hearing them describe everything with such pessimism, well, Jesus took the mic, and now he went through the same events, but seen in the light of God's redemptive plan, in a way, wow, that just opened new horizons and made their hearts start to burn with zeal. I mean, they, they just must have been taking in everything that he was saying. It must have been the greatest reframe that the world has ever seen. The greatest reframe ever. And of course this got them amazingly excited. And we know too, you know, when the dark shadows of the past cast their poisonous influence on the way we think and feel, we certainly can be uh, weighed down. But we can look low, we can be like, you know, that woman, you know that story of the woman in the gospel that was bent over, you know, crouched over with a bad back, and all she did was just see the ground, and she saw life merely from a human point of view, right? until, until Jesus raised her up. Right? And uh, so now she could see properly around her, and he gave her a new vision, because he straightened her up to see. Now, naturally, we can't change the past. Of course, we can't do that. But, you know, the past can still affect us deeply. All we can do is change our vision of the past. Right? And that's what Jesus was doing. He was giving a new perspective. But he prodded them now to see the present moment in a way that helped them experience intensively a communion with his divine presence. He, was, he explained the past, but he was making them focus on the present. And when I thought about that, I, I thought about the famous passage there, well, famous passage from uh, Jacques Philippe in one of his books. He says this, he says, We have to be convinced that every moment, whatever it brings, it is filled with God's presence and offers the possibility of communion with God. Our relationship with God is not established in the past or in the future, but in our welcoming each moment as a way through which God gives himself to us. Every second is a moment of commuting, of communion with eternity, and in a way contains eternity. And yes, these disciples were lamenting the past, but they now, you know, instead of feeling like, like victims of a delusion, right, they were now suddenly you know, thrilled by the very reality of God's presence among them. Before, they seemed to, to worry too much about the past or what was going to come next about the future. They thought, well, we're going to be unemployed, we're going to have no job, no income, and you know, all that money we invested in Jesus was like, it's like all their money was in a hedge fund that turned out to be a scam, with no insurance. But after Jesus spoke to them and appeared to them, the breaking of the bread, boy, they were on fire. And they ran, they ran afterwards to tell the others in Jerusalem with such radiant joy. Wow, they were super thrilled. And well, I suspect that these guys who were worrying about the future and lamenting the past, actually, they probably ended up being martyrs, like practically all the apostles. Right? They, so, you know, they were totally ready to shed their blood for Jesus. Even if they knew this, the very idea of dying for you, Jesus, would have felt like an honor, a special grace, that it was truly worthwhile enduring. And of course, we know the gospel today largely because of their words and what they said. And they were willing to die for us. Let's be radiant. Let's be hopeful. As Jesus has big plans for our life. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, 
my guardian angel, intercede for me.